Now, it wouldn't be a uh, law talk if we didn't have a disclaimer. Um, so there we go, it's my own private views. It does not in any way reflect the views of my employer, nor does it influence or reflect any work that I do within my employment. Uh, also, it's not legal advice. If you are coming to a conference to get legal advice, that's very foolish. Um, I'd suggest that uh, if you do have a copyright problem, you speak to a lawyer, uh, because every problem is different. So I'll just give you a bit of a rundown of what we're going to talk about today. Um, now, hopefully I've managed to purge all the uh, law words out of this presentation, but some may have got through. It's designed for non-lawyers. If I say something that you don't understand, please put your hand up and say, what does that word mean? Um, obviously, we're going to need to talk a little bit about the law, so um, some law words may have got through. Um, it's basically in four parts. We're going to talk about um, the Australian Law Reform Commission interim discussion paper that was released uh, early, this, oh, early last year. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the fair dealing exceptions in Australian copyright law. Then we'll talk about the issue of fair use, uh, the government's position on this. Um, and as I said, questions are fine, um, particularly if it's just a clarification question. If you've got a longer, more detailed question, might leave it to the end. I've left some time there for that. So, Australian copyright. There have been several recent important copyright cases in Australia, um, two of which I spoke about. <laughs> um, uh, the Kookaburra case, which is what we're going to use today, is a bit of an illustrative case uh, for the fair dealing and fair use uh, in the uh, presentation today. Uh, there was the IINet case, which was secondary liability of ISPs, won't, won't really touch on that one. And the Optus TV Now case, which is um, uh, basically about the private and domestic use exceptions in Australian copyright law. We'll touch on that as well. Um, now, Australian copyright law deals by exception. So there are a bunch of exceptions called the fair dealing exceptions, um, and you need to fit your use of copyright material under those exceptions. Um, there's time and format shifting exceptions as well. So it's not like the US where they have a general fair use defence. Um, so in June 2012, because we've had all these uh, major changes to copyright law through um, these various cases, uh, the previous government asked the Australian Law Reform Commission to examine Australian copyright law, and, and specifically they asked them to look at whether a fair use defence would be appropriate. So here are the terms of reference, or some of the terms of reference that we're going to talk about today. Um, the ALRC was asked to look at whether we need to recognise fair use of copyright material um, or allow transformative, innovative and collaborative use of copyright materials to create and deliver new products and services to the public benefit and allow appropriate access, use, interaction and production of copyright material online for social, private or domestic purposes. Essentially what that means is, should we have some more exceptions in the copyright law um, or should we use fair use as a general defence? And we'll talk about these. Um, the report that came from the review was submitted to the Attorney General in November of last year. Um, unfortunately, Parliament was no longer sitting at that time. Um, and so the 15 parliamentary sitting days to table the report um, have not elapsed. So we haven't seen the report. Um, and we haven't seen what the government's comments on, on that report are. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about the interim discussion paper that was released. Uh, it pretty much gives the kind of direction that the ALRC was thinking. So as I said, we're going to use the Kookaburra case as an illustrative case for the fair dealing and, and the potential uh, defence of fair use. Um, now, does everyone know the song Down Under by Men at Work? I'm not going to sing it, even though I threatened to. <laughs> uh, and does everyone know the Kookaburra song? Everyone went to primary school in Australia? You can probably remember singing that. Um, as you can see, it's a very old song, 1932, but because of the rather long period of uh, copyright uh, term, um, it's still under copyright. And Down Under was released in 1981. Now, in 2007, a musical quiz show called Spicks and Specks uh, had a question that uh, referred to the flute riff in the song Down Under. They said, um, you know, what is the other Australian song that is contained within Down Under? And if you know the songs, you'll know that the flute riff is actually it's quite difficult to pick out the kookaburra, but it's definitely there. And they uh, basically answer the question correctly. Yes, kookaburra's in there. This was in 2007, so a long time after these uh, songs were actually written. And so, of course, what happened? The record companies went to court over it. Um, now, the, the actual case... It's interesting, it's got a lot of um, sort of esoteric issues about ownership and that sort of thing, which really don't uh, impact on this particular presentation. 
But it was found that uh, Down Under used a whole or substantive part of Kookaburra, and therefore it infringed on the copyright of Kookaburra. Now, in Australian law, basically you're not allowed to use any more than a whole, you know, if you use a whole or substantive part and you don't have a license, it's infringement. Um, it's not like in the US where you've got fair use. Um, so it didn't actually change the law at all. In fact, um, it, it, it's pretty, uh, you know, it, it, it pretty much follows Australian law in this area. Um, but it was an important case nonetheless. And it was important because of the reaction of the public and of the musical community uh, to the finding. Um, because it took two culturally significant songs in Australia, Kookaburra and Down Under, um, and it uh, you know, mashed them together. And really the subject matter of Down Under was, like I said, culturally significant. And as Justice Emmett pointed out, uh, the quotation or reproduction of the melody in Kookaburra appears by way of tribute to the iconicity of Kookaburra and is one of a number of references made in Down Under to Australian icons. So it was really all about lots of Australian things, uh, including Vegemite. Um, and obviously references to trademarks because of the way that trademark law works, that's not, a, not an infringement. However, the reference to Kookaburra in the same sort of way was copyright infringement because of the way that copyright works. And so it really cl clashed the ordinary use of uh, works, the sort of view that the general public has of the way that, you know, what's fair to use as far as copyright is concerned, and the sort of hard-nosed legal view, which is that it's infringement. So, as I've mentioned before, the US has a general fair use defence. So if the use is fair, then you've got a defence against infringement. However, Australian Copyright Act only deals by the exception, so there is a presumption of infringement unless you can fit it under one of those exceptions. And they're known as the fair dealing exceptions. So what is fair dealing? Well, as you can see, it's a fairly limited list of things. Um, you've got to fit it under one of those exceptions and the use has got to be fair. Uh, so we've got exceptions for research and study, criticism or review, parody or satire, reporting the news, and some stuff for lawyers. And it also has to be fair. And so when we're weighing up whether it's fair, we look at the purpose and the character of the dealing, the nature of the work, the possibility of obtaining the work uh, for a, uh, a license at an ordinary commercial price within a reasonable time frame, uh, the effect of the dealing or recording upon the market for or the value of the work, and the amount and substantiality of the part of the work that has been used. So we weigh up all those factors and work out whether it's, it's fair, but you need to fit it under one of those exceptions first. So, it's a whole heap of things that we might think in the ordinary course of dealing are fair, but are not. Well, they're not fair dealing at least. So sampling, that's right out. Um, Non-commercial use of incidental music, um, you stick some music in the background of a YouTube video, that's probably infringement. Uh, transformation of copyrighted work, except for parody or satire. Now, um, Kookaburra really was a transformation, or down, sorry, Down Under was a transformation of the song Kookaburra, but um, that's not a fair dealing. Uh, memes, those stuff that you might uh, share around on Twitter or Facebook, um, they're probably infringing copyright. Um, commercial services to allow recording in the cloud, that's a TV Now case that was uh, decided uh, a couple of years ago. Um, storage of copyright material in the cloud, potentially. Um, Optus TV in our case made that a little dicey. Um, we can't copy a DVD to other devices. However, if you do have a copy on VHS, that's okay, because you can actually do that. It, it's, it's a very specific exception. So um, any of those old 80s movies you can put on your computer. Um, things that search engines do, um, uh, probably a good example is things like thumbnails, uh, probably infringement. Um, and digital archiving. It's, really, it's actually quite difficult to um, archive things digitally. It's fine if you print it out, stick it in a folder somewhere in, in a dusty archive room, but if you try and do it digitally, uh, you can run into all sorts of problems. So you normally think that, that was fair, but they don't fit under those exceptions. So should we have more exceptions? And I'm going to look at three different types of exceptions that the ALRC was asked to look at uh, for quotations, transformative use, and private and domestic use. And then we'll talk about, you know, is it better just to have a fair use defence? So uh, what about an exception for quotations? Well, the Berne Convention, which is sort of the granddaddy of international copyright treaties, uh, has an exception for quotation. So it says you can have an exception for quotation. Um, but that really does require a very expansive use of quotation. When I say I quoted him, um, you usually think, well, that's, you've actually used the, the, the term verbatim. Um, 
it's not really a par you know, otherwise you say I paraphrased him. So it's, it does require quite an expansive use of the term quotation, and it doesn't really cover transformation um, because it does imply a verbatim use. So you're kind of relying on quotes to take a very expansive view, and you, you probably don't want to do that because they're just as likely to take a narrow view, and that kind of takes the meat out of it as an exception. But let's have a look at what it might look like as an exception. Well, you'd probably look at the purpose of uh, the particular quotation that you're using. And uh, Justice Emmett um, uh, also pointed out in the Kookaburra case that um, the better view of the taking of the melody from Kookaburra is not that the melody was taken in order to save effort on the part of the composer of Down Under by appropriating the results of Miss Sinclair's efforts. Miss Sinclair was the one who wrote Kookaburra. Rather, the quotation or reproduction of the melody of Kookaburra appears by way of tribute. So that's probably a purpose that would fit very well under this exception if you had a broad view of the term quotation. Um, if you were just grabbing a piece of work and sticking it into your, um, your song um, to save trouble, um, you, that probably wouldn't work. You'd also need to look at the fairness of the quotation, probably using those fairness factors. Uh, you need to have sufficient acknowledgement of the quotation, and, and in some types of artwork, that, that's going to be quite hard. Um, it probably works better as an example of fair use, uh, and because of the sort of requirement for it to be quite an expansive uh, use of the term quotation, it is difficult as a standalone exception. So what about transformation, which is what um, Men at Work did with the Kookaburra song? Um, well, the ALRC says the uh, transformation is the use of a pre-existing work to create something new that is not merely a substitute for the pre-existing work. So things like mashups and remixes and the like. Now, in the US, because they've got this fair use uh, defence, um, it's actually just an example of what might be considered a fair use. Um, and I've got a quote there. Basically, they say that transformations, the transformation of works lie at the heart of the fair use doctrine's guarantee of breathing space within the confines of copyright. So, as I said, it's an example of fair use um, rather than a, a standalone type of exception. But what would it look like as an exception? Uh, well, you're going to run into problems. Uh, if you have a low threshold, that is, we just create a new work, so we tweak things a little, and that's a transformation, you are undermining the creator's rights. Um, basically, you only need to tweak it a little bit and all of a sudden you've got something that you can, you can use. Um, if you put a high threshold on there, well, where does that cut in? How much change do I have to do? Was Kookaburra changed enough to be a trans transformative work or is it more a copy? So you run into those sorts of problems. Now in Canada, they've basically gone down the path of uh, the exception route and, and they've put a low threshold on there, but they've said, look, only for non-commercial use. We're going to have a, all sorts of problems with non-commercial use. You put it on a website that has advertising on there, is that commercial use? If you um, share it through Twitter that um, you, know, you use to promote your own professional services as well as sharing memes, is that going to be commercial use or not? It's, it's difficult to say. And I think the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network put it quite well in their submission to the ALRC. Uh, there is little to be gained from having courts applying themselves to assessing mashups or a remix to ascertain whether they fall within a tightly worded exception when the real issue is whether the use is fair and the extent of harm to the creator. So it's a very difficult exception to, to really play out. So what about private and domestic use? Well, currently we've got a couple of uh, examples of private and domestic use that are uh, in the, the Copyright Act, uh, format shifting and time shifting. Uh, as I said, um, only analogue for format shifting, so your VHS tapes are safe, your DVDs, you have to just have them on DVD. Um, time shifting, uh, devices in the home are okay, um, as soon as you move into the cloud, that's a real problem, as the TV Now case showed. And storage and access from commercial cloud services, that's quite uncertain. It's really not a technology neutral uh, exception, uh, which is unfortunate. <coughs> but how would we look at it as an exception? Well, the, the Canadians, like I said, have gone down that path. Um, they've put in a generic uh, time shifting and format shifting uh, exception. Uh, but of course it, cr d yeah, sorry? So just a question on that. Yep. The digital. So is there actually a word, like is there a word in so that it says that you can only do it to analog and not digital? So that's yep. So the question was, um, is the uh, drafting of the exception in the Copyright Act so specific that it only um, has analogue and not digital? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's really poorly drafted. <laughs> um, so the, the Canadians have gone down that, uh, that road, uh, road um, and they've made it a general technology neutral format and time shifting exception. 
But of course, when you get into those commercial services that do that time shifting and format shifting, um, you, you might run into problems. Uh, they also have uh, an exception for social uses. Um, but again, it's that non-commercial social use. So as I said, if you're advertising particular professional services through Twitter and um, you also like to put out something funny every now and again for your customers and that's uh, using copyright material, is that a commercial use? Maybe, you don't know. Uh, so the exception model that, that Canada's gone down, I think it creates quite a bit of uncertainty around some of these services and is still quite narrow. So what about fair use? Well, fair use is a defence to infringement, and it asks the fundamental question, is the use of the copyright material fair? What does that mean? Well, we'll, we'll go to the, uh, the US Copyright Act. Um, and really, the, the thing I want to point out there is, is not um, the sort of uh, header text there, it's really those uh, fairness factors. Um, again, it's the purpose and the character of the use, including whether such use is of commercial nature, the nature of the copyright work, the amount and substantiality, the effect of the use upon the potential market. Does that sound familiar? I think that sounds like the uh, fairness factors that we have in our act. And you'd be right. So what's it going to look like in Australia if we decide to go down that route? Well, um, you probably have those fairness factors and you probably take the ones uh, from our own act or, or use the US ones. Um, you'd have illustrative uses, um, and I've talked about those, uh, transformation, private and domestic use, quotation, a bunch of others. Um, as in the US, it'd be a non-exhaustive list, so you can make it quite flexible. And that means that you're just weighing up the factors, which does make it quite a flexible exception. You can see that in the US, where various fair use cases, it's all about weighing up those factors. So as I said, it asks the question, is it fair? And that means that you can better align it to community expectations. Uh, the Kookaburra case, classic example. Um, People thought that that use was probably okay, um, and it was okay for many, many years until the Spicks and Specs episode pointed out that it might have been an appropriation of another song. Um, it allows innovation. It's technology neutral. You don't have to talk about you know, whether it's digital or analog or anything like that. Really the question is, is it fair? It doesn't really matter what technology you use. It balances the interests of consumers of copyright material and uh, creators, and because it's non-exhaustive, it's very, very flexible. So as I said, it allows you to easy, more easily align it to community expectations. And um, we can see that in, as I said before, the transformation of musical works in Kookaburra. Uh, now this uh, quote from Paul Kelly, another Australian musician, it's actually not from the ALRC reviews, it's from a doco. But I think it sort of sums up the music industry's view quite nicely. In blues, folk and country and soul music, the building blocks of pop, words, words lines and whole verses have been swimming around forever from song to song. Melodies too. I remember when sampling first became popular with the rise of hip hop and a lot of musicians I knew who prided themselves on being able to play their instruments um, properly were dismissive. They said, that's not music. They sniffed, anyone could do that. But sampling made perfect sense to me. I'd been doing it since I first started making songs. And I think a lot of musicians really do view music that way. I mean, I, I, I play a musical instrument. Um, I've written songs before. Um, and yeah, you obviously appropriate other melodies and that sort of thing. And um, as the EFA pointed out, many Australian consumers, when the limitations of fair dealing exceptions are explained to them, roll their eyes in disbelief that the law insists that such things that they consider legitimate everyday activities are in fact illegal. Discussions on this topic tend to ridicule the law. And that's never a good thing because it means that people won't follow it. Um, if they think it's stupid, they won't do it. And that doesn't help anyone. Uh, fair use also encourages innovation. Um, as Yahoo pointed out, under Australia's existing copyright regime, very many socially useful and economically beneficial technological innovations would simply have no breathing space to emerge. They would be blocked at the first post by a copyright regime that is insufficiently flexible to accommodate technological innovation. And even when a large company like Optus can put out a uh, service like TV Now and have that chopped off at the socks, um, you know, if you're an independent application developer, uh, you're really going to be out of luck. Um, Application development can thrive in Australia if there is a broader approach to how content can be used by others while still ensuring that such use does not deprive the rights holder of a legitimate revenue stream or impact the market value of the underlying work. So again, Yahoo's pointing out, look, you know, it's really about whether it's fair. It's one of those fairness factors, you know, the, the um, uh, effect on market value. Now, fair use also promotes balance in copyright. 
because it's all about weighing up those factors and asking the question, is it fair? The Joint Standing Committees on Treaties, when they were examining the uh, Australia-US Free Trade Agreement, which um, extended copyright um, extensions quite a bit, um, they recommended that the Australian Doctrine of Fair Dealing uh, should be substituted for the American Doctrine of Fair Use. Um, because it would counter the effects of the extension of copyright protection. So the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties is pointing out, look, you know, we've, we've gone a long way towards protecting copyright interests. We, we might need to balance it out by having a much more flexible uh, situation. And the Australian Consumer and Competition Commission pointed out that an exception like this is likely to promote an appropriate balance between socially beneficial incentives to create and incentives to disseminate and use copyright material. So uh, the government regulator for, for consumer um, uh, stuff uh, basically agrees that it does provide balance. It's also quite flexible. Now the current law has a closed list. As I said, you know, those fair dealing exceptions, you've got to put it under there. Um, and as Telstra pointed out, the current exceptions are generally uh, created in response to existing technologies, economies and circumstances. As a result, they tend to have a narrow patchwork application to circumstances existing at the time the exception is introduced. And we can see that. Um, the time shifting exception, for example, introduced in 2006. Betamax, 22 years beforehand, a fair use case in the US that essentially enabled the video recorder took 22 years of Australians busily infringing copyright <laughs> to then have it introduced into the Australian law. So changes to the law are slow um, and generally fairly inflexible. Now there are certainly arguments against the introduction of fair use in Australia. Um, and in the ALRC submissions, uh, one of the main things that uh, they pointed out, the people who were against it, um, said that there was no case made out for the need for a fair use exception. I think I think I've probably made out a fairly good case. <laughs> um, they also say it creates uncertainty because it, it uh, shifts the power from Parliament to make exceptions in law to the judiciary to decide what's fair and what's not. Um, and it requires litigation to determine what's fair use. Um, it originated in a different legal environment. So the Americans, uh, in their constitution, they actually have a bit about copyright. We don't have that sort of constitutional guidance. Uh, they also have 170 years of jurisprudence, uh, including the last 35 years where they've codified it into their law. So it's a well-known doctrine in the US. Um, they're saying you can't just sort of grab a well-known doctrine from somewhere else and, and stick it in Australian law. Um, and they also argue that international law, um, the Berne Convention, TRIPS and the AOSFTA, uh, which contain within them uh, what's known as the three-step test, we'll get to that a bit later, they say it doesn't actually comply with that. So does it really create uncertainty? Well, already in Australian law, you have quite abstracted standards and principles. So rather than sort of being very prescriptive about what you can and can't do, we have these standards and principles. And a good example is um, in Australian consumer law, um, in the course of trade or commerce, you're not allowed to engage in misleading and deceptive conduct. Now, that doesn't tell you what the conduct is. It doesn't tell you what you can and can't do. It doesn't have the exceptions or anything like that. But we have that sort of fairly abstracted um, standard misleading deceptive conduct. And it really is just the ordinary use of the word. It's, sure, there's been lots of litigation about it, but it's generally just the ordinary uses of the word. In unfair contracts, um, we actually uh, weigh the factors of whether a term in a contract is unfair. So if we've got two organisations that are, they've got teams and teams of lawyers, and um, we're looking at a term in a contract, we'll probably say, well, that's actually not, probably not an unfair term because you know, they've got the resources to make sure that it's fair. But if it's a company with huge armies of lawyers and an individual, you might, that might tip the balance to sort of go, well, it probably is an unfair term. Um, and if you want to look at the sort of ultimate abstracted uh, <laughs> principles and uh, standards, you can look at the privacy principles. Now, the Privacy Act needs to uh, regulate the entirety of the Australian public service and business. And obviously, there are a whole heap of very, very different ways and uh, uses of information, reasons for collecting it. If you had to try and have a prescriptive list of things you can and can't do and reasons why you can um, uh, pick up information and use it in particular ways, I mean, the, the, the act would be enormous um, and horrendously complex. Sorry? It'd be even more enormous. That's actually not an enormous act, gee. <laughs> Look at the Copyright Act. Look at the Tax Act. Oh. Um, 
the, uh, so they're, they're quite abstracted. So it's not unusual in Australian law to have these um, uh, standards and principles. And so a standard and principle of fairness is, is really very much along these sorts of lines. I think that argument tends to fall on its ear if you look at other areas of Australian law. Uh, now they say also that it comes from a different legal environment. And while this is true, um, they actually come from the same sorts of common law roots. Um, the, the Americans only codified it around, I think it was 35 years ago or thereabouts. Um, before that, it was all common law. And you know, those fairness factors that you see in the codified American law, very similar to the fairness factors that we have in our law. So it's a bit strange to sort of say, well, you know, it's all completely different. It's not. And I suppose to point out the obvious, um, when we entered into a free trade agreement with the US, uh, one of the things it was meant to do was to harmonise copyright law, often in bad ways. <laughs> But, um, you know, if you look at the um, uh, FTA regulatory impact statement, they said, the harmonisation of our laws with the world's largest intellectual property market will provide Australian exporters with a more familiar environment and certain legal environment for the export of value-added goods to the United States. Excellent. In turn, US investors will be attracted to the Australian market because of greater familiarity and confidence in our legal system. Sounds like a really good argument for importing fair use because it's a very well-known doctrine in the US and it provides them that flexibility. So, you know, it, to, to sort of say, well, it comes from a different legal environment, again, it kind of falls on its ear. Now, the other argument they make is about international law, and international treaties of which we are a signatory. And there's the three-step test. So it says, if you're going to introduce exceptions into your copyright law, they need to be for certain special cases which do not conflict with the normal exploitation of the copyright material and do not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the rights holder. And the one that they tend to focus on is that certain special cases. They're saying fair use is not a certain special case, it's actually a really broad defence. And there's a lot of academic argument about it, but it is just that, it's academic. There are exceptions that existed at the time of negotiation. It is unlikely that countries wanted to actually extinguish their own exceptions by, by treaty. US fair use has never been challenged. And other jurisdictions have introduced fair use without challenge. So I think you might be able to make a case that it doesn't fit under certain special cases. Um, but the practical implication is it's, it's never really been challenged and it's unlikely to ever, be, ever uh, do so. So I think that argument uh, is, is, is probably fairly weak as well. So what should it look like if we do import fair use into Australia? Well, the Australian Law Reform Commission said that the fair use exception should contain an express statement that fair use of copyright material does not infringe copyright. Well, that's a bit of a no-brainer. <laughs> a non-exhaustive list of factors, so those fairness factors again, um, and a non-exhaustive list of illustrative cases. So things like transformation or quotation, those sorts of things. So what should the fairness factors look like? Gee, they look familiar again. <laughs> Purpose and the nature of the, uh, the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyright material, um, the substantiality of it, and the effect on the potential market. So those are those fairness factors that you see in the US law, and they're also the ones that you see in the Australian Act. And a non-exhaustive list of illustrative purposes. And these are just what the ALRC suggested. There's probably some more that you could add there. Uh, but like I said, it's non-exhaustive. You don't need to fit it underneath one of these things. Um, and as you can see, all the fair dealing ones are there, plus a couple of extra ones. Um, but of course, they're just illustrative uses. Um, so you might have a use that is transformative, but it's not fair. Um, so it's not like the exception where first you have to jam it under an exception, and then you've got to work out whether it's fair. Um, basically, you can point to the fact that it's a transformative use, but the question still is, is it fair? But it's much, much more flexible. So what's the government's position on this? Unfortunately, it hasn't been tabled in Parliament, so we can't actually see the government's reaction to the report itself, which is a grand pity because I would have loved to talk about it today. However, we can look at some of the statements, public statements that have been made by the government. Uh, now, the Attorney General, George Brandis, and the Attorney General's department, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, the Attorney General's department is the one that has um, responsibility for copyright. So George Brandis said to the Australian Directors Guild, Whatever form those reforms take, I want to assure you, following from the observations I've just made about my own attitudes to intellectual property protection, that those reforms will not impinge on or violate the rights of content creators and the owners of intellectual property. They will be designed to further secure and protect those rights. 
Now, um, the emphasis there is mine because um, can anyone uh, notice that there's one lot that are missing from there? <laughs> Consumers of intellectual property? Yes, everyone else, that's right. The rights of content creators and the owners of intellectual property, they're the only ones that, they, that matter. Um, that doesn't really bode well for the introduction of a fair use exception, um, so uh, hopefully I'm wrong. <laughs> um, the Prime Minister Tony Abbott has also committed to several free trade agreements, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and if you didn't see Sky's talk yesterday, um, I'd urge you to look at the video. Um, basically, the TPP contains quite a few intellectual property provisions, um, many of which are fairly hostile to the idea of fair use, um, so I think that um, uh, that could be quite highly problematic, um, which is unfortunate. So. Where do we go now? Um, as I said, the ALRC report release is imminent. Um, so the next parliamentary sitting is in February, um, so it'll be 15 days, and then it'll be tabled, and we will get the government's actual position on it. Well, they'll table it and they'll make comment on it. <laughs> so but we might have a bit better idea. Um, it's very likely that copyright holders will and probably have been lobbying against fair use. Um, and the government has shown it's more responsive to, to business rather than consumer demands. Um, again, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is sitting in the background there, um, and that's probably fairly, highly, fairly problematic for um, the introduction of an exception like fair use. It doesn't preclude it by any stretch of the imagination, but it, you know, if you're going down the path of strengthening copyright and, and that's the sort of treaty that you want to sign, um, it's unlikely that uh, ideologically you are going to put something in there like fair use. So it is unlikely that this government will legislate a fair use exception. It's much more likely that copyright will become more restrictive, um, particularly if the TPPA is signed. So what can we do? Well, there might be a Senate election in Western Australia coming up. Might be. Um, the result has been declared, um, but it is in the Court of Disputed Returns at the moment, and the Court of Disputed Returns may order a fresh election. That'll be fun. Um, <laughs> So if this is important to you, you might like to look at some of the candidates and work out whether they are more likely to introduce a more flexible copyright regime or are not, and choose to vote for them. Um, so it's, it's definitely worthwhile, and, and particularly if you live in Western Australia, and if they do order a new election, because I mean, anything could happen, they, it, the Court of Disputed Returns may just accept the result or they may order a new election. Uh, but if there is one, certainly look at the uh, candidates. And the other thing we can do is lobby. And as I said, uh, Sky's talk yesterday uh, talked about various techniques for doing that. Um, you can contact your local MP. Um, you can contact your local senator. Um, it's often a good idea to call them rather than to send them letters. Um, you might even uh, want to organise a meeting with them. Sometimes, if, if they're a backbencher, they quite often will meet with you. And you can get your point across. And it's important, lobbying does actually make a difference. So what should we say to them? Well, in my opinion, <laughs> the introduction of fair use defence would assist the Australian software industry because it removes that uncertainty. So when you're trying to use other copyrighted material um, or you're trying to uh, have a, a device that does an innovative use of other people's copyright material, I don't know, like TV Now or like a video recorder, um, uh, like the Betamax case, um, it means that you can sort of look, look at those fairness factors and you can judge whether that use is fair. Um, was that fair use? Sorry? Was that fair use, me taking a photo? Uh, yeah, sure. I can give you, copy, I can give you permission. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think these are actually release, uh, released under a fairly permissive licence, so <laughs> that's fine. But I'll give you my model release as well. <laughs> <laughs> it balances the interests of, of copyright holders and... Uh, and uh, users of copyright material. And it's in the interest of IP holders that people understand the law and the law makes sense. As I said before, a lot of people sort of think, well, you know, what, what the guys at Men at Work did with Kookaburra, that was you know, a tribute to the song, that's, surely that was okay, but it's not under Australian law. In, in US law, it would be okay. Um, it's, it's very likely that that would be fair. In fact, I don't think it would even go to litigation. It's, it's much more likely that um, it would just go through to the keeper. And so if Australia wants to improve its IP output and become a net exporter, it does need a flexible fair use defence to encourage innovation. Um, so, you know, things like the Optus TV Now system, um, you know, that, that uh, is more, more likely would have got up under a fair use type of defence. I mean, it may not have, but um, it certainly uh, was a lot harder to make out the time-shifting exception. <laughs> 
So, and like I said, if a big company like Optus um, can't get something up, um, you know, an independent application developer, um, you know, you're in a whole mess of trouble. Copyright laws are very expensive. Um, and uh, often people will just not, not do it because it's just too hard. Um, so that's all I've got time for today. Um, happy to take questions. Uh, Oh, absolutely. So, so there seems to be, if, if the government's interest is in supporting business, there seems to be an argument that business would benefit by the increase of value in their intellectual property uh, under a fair use. Has there been any work done on, on sort of quantifying the value of intellectual property that a, a fair use clause um, would, would, would bring? Okay, so the question was, has there been any work uh, on what value to business a fair use uh, defence would bring? Um, I'm not aware of it. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there has been. Um, and I think the point that you make that, uh, you know, there will obviously be good value to the software industry for this sort of defence is, is probably a valid one. Um, but the government often, I suppose, you know, who's value? So you've got to weigh it up and I think they tend to be a little more um, happy to uh, look at the value to the US movie industry and the like than software developers in Australia. That's just my opinion, of course, but... <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's more the problem. Uh, yeah. So we seem to be modelling more and more of our law on what the US is doing, but we're fighting against the notion of fair use, which is common practice in the US. The <coughs> Canadians have a law that seems to look like what we have, and they seem to be having a great relationship with the US. So why is this a big deal? Uh, okay, so the question is, why is the introduction of fair use such a big deal when we seem to be following the Americans um, as far as their copyright law is concerned? Um, it's, I suppose, uh, the Americans have had it for you know, 170 years, so it's, it's quite a, a, a well-known doctrine in the US, um, and generally the US likes to export the bad parts of its copyright law to other people, <laughs> um, not the good bits. Uh, I think that's probably why it's, it's quite controversial. Uh, as I said, the, the arguments against fair use, I think, are fairly weak. But, um, you know, there are powerful interests lobbying against it. So I think that's really what the problem is. Ayn? Sure. Um, you, you mentioned business and consumers mm -hmm. along the way. It's not specifically in your science, I believe, but I've, I've long kind of, in my, in my mind, had an objection against that terminology mm -hmm. because in some cases, when you refer, when one refers to business, it seems to actually only mean a very specific subset of big businesses with some vested interest. So yep. like the, you know, the, um, you know, the, you know, the, that, that kind of stuff. And at the same time, many people who, or organizations or companies that actually could be regarded as consumers are actually content producers now in the internet and so on. That's, that's even more the case. Yep. It's actually a very fuzzy thing and not being too restrictive about use actually helps everybody and that, that could be small content producers. Yeah, that's true. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So the, the, the question or the, the comment was that um, uh, the dichotomy of uh, business and consumers is, is not very precise um, and that uh, uh, basically, there are a lot of businesses that are also consumers and content creators. I, I suppose the, 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 um, the distinction I was trying to make is uh, intellectual property holders um, and consumers of intellectual property, which is a bit of a mouthful. So, <laughs> But yes, you're right. But I think, I think the point Arian is trying to make is that the consumers are now also content creators, so they mm. are intellectual property holders in their own right. I think that's what you're trying to say, that they're merging. Yes. That it's not yes. Disney that's the intellectual copyright. The, the IP holder, it's you know small enterprises that, that are also IP holders. Yes, and I think that's a, a very strong argument for why we probably should have a fair use exception. It seems artificial. Yes. yes. Um, it's up to you. Or just to follow up to that, 
mm -hmm. by the original photographer. And yeah, whereas if you did turn it the other way around and started ripping off their photos in, the, in their paper, they're, they're very quick to come down on. Yep, okay, and, so the. And, so, and, in, and the other, my other follow up is in, the, in current newspapers when they, where they're online, that stays online forever. Yep. It's not just printed once and given away. So the, the, the comment there was that um, the, there's a news media exception um, and uh, news media quite often troll YouTube and Facebook and that sort of thing for photos that they use in their news stories um, and uh, that if it was flipped around and we were using uh, photos that they had uh, taken, uh, they'd come down on us hard. Well, unfortunately, that's just the nature of, of the way that law often works, that um, uh, people who don't have a lot of resources aren't able to sue. Um, but the thing is, they are still bound by the law, so um, if they are making use of someone's Facebook photo for the purposes of news and reporting, um, that will fall under the exception, but it still needs to be fair. Um, they can't just sort of use it and exploit it for you know, commercial gain, and it's still got to be a fair, fair um, use of it. Um, so uh, it's really up to the copyright holder then to sue. Obviously news organisations are more likely to sue because they've got lots of lawyers. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. Yes. Yep. Um, what effect has that had on this kind of copyright law? Uh, it, uh, it's not really to do with fair use, it's to do with secondary liability of ISPs, of intermediaries. Um, I just mentioned it because it's one of the three cases. It was one of the things that the ALRC also looked at. Um, and it's also one of the things in the TPP. Uh, the TPP actually has specific things in there that uh, say that uh, you need to have better secondary liability of ISPs, which is not a good thing, in my opinion. <laughs> um, sorry, just a, a follow-up to Simon's comment before about um, the media in Australia using um, uh, individuals' um, content published online and putting that in news and, and the, the, there being a perception that they can just get away with that. I actually know a few people who have had that happen to them. If you make enough noise to the news agencies, they will pay you um, because yeah. they don't want this is true, yeah. I actually know quite a number of, of grants who have had that happen and they've made enough noise and they've actually been paid for use of the collection property. Admittedly, it's close to mm. but yeah. if you pressure them, they will. So, so the comment there was that um, uh, where news media have actually used photos, people who have kicked up enough noise um, that uh, news media will generally pay you. Um, yeah, this is true. They don't want to be, uh, they don't want to be involved in litigation. Um, it's often quite cheap to get a license for someone's photo, so they're, they're much more likely to go down that path. Okay, so the comment uh, was that um, we should all have uh, equal protection for our uh, copyright. Uh, we're all content producers now. Yeah, that's what a fair use exception tends to, yeah. to allow. Um, I mean, it works both ways um, in, in the sense that, you know, I might write something um, and someone might like that and take it and transform it. Um, and that might be a fair use of that material. And it might be a huge business that's doing that. Um, Okay, so the question was, um, does fair use have any implications for GPL licensed software? Um, not specifically. Um, I think it would be very, very difficult to make out a fair use defence of taking someone's code and sticking it in your own and saying that's a fair use. Um, but that's a defence that's open to you. Um, the fact that you do accept a licence when you take that material um, complicates that quite a bit. So um, I'd say, qualifiedly, no, it doesn't. <laughs> yep. What is a non-consumptive use? Oh, um, so it's a use of material um, that, uh, that you don't consume. So I, I suppose um, 
uh, where you take a photo and you just republish it, that sort of thing. Um, it's a bit hard to explain, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's like that. Well, you don't actually use it for anything, you're just basically replicating. Yes. How is that defined? Because <laughs> things like memes often very quickly go into the realm of satire. Mm. Historically, it's amazing. You could even make possibly wild ones and say that the, the Kookaburra Down Under thing, the whole song is kind of um, the caricature um, stereotype. So, is that actually satire as a whole and therefore mm. it kind of falls in there? So the, yeah. so, so the question was basically, um, what are the limits of the parody and satire um, uh, exception? Uh, yes, that argument was made. Uh, no, it didn't fly. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, th there's been a little bit of litigation around parody and satire, but not a lot. Um, uh, it's generally the ordinary use of the word. So yeah, a lot of memes would fall under satire, or certainly would fall under parody. Um, but... Uh, you know, you need to go to court to test it. <laughs> um, it's not an easy one to, to work out, which is why fair use is better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, ben. I think, I mean, this is, it's really interesting because it's news to me that we didn't have fair use. So um, I'd always assume that if you had like you know, 10 or 20 lines of code, that, that code, it wasn't worth putting a, a license on because it could be kind of just reused under fair use. Does that mean that code can't be reused? Is there any exception? Uh, yeah, it, code, code is difficult. It, it would need to be a whole of substantive part um, uh, under the, the, the current regime. Um, uh, fair use of code, um, I think that's it's quite highly problematic because you know one line actually does something. It does quite a bit of things. So um, yeah, the, the sort of whole of substantive part, it's going to be a tiny, tiny amount and probably none at all. So it, yeah, I think with code, you, you really are getting into the realm of licensing. Um, so you either got just copyright on it, so it's my copyright and you need a license or you BSD it or you GPL it or whatever myriad of licenses that there are out there. May I just add something to that? Mm. I dealt with this kind of stuff at my school in terms of um, bug fixes and, and that kind of stuff, like one or two line things, is that copyrighted? As it turns out, it is different in different countries. Some mm. countries that one line code is actually technically copyrighted. So if someone wishes to make a contribution that's actually only a couple of lines, Okay, so, so Arjen's comment there was that um, uh, you know, in some jurisdictions it's quite, the, the substantiality test is, is quite different and that's, that's true and yes, if you are going to just contribute one line of code, um, you probably should uh, have some form of release or license or the like on it and I, I mean I think that goes with, with anything really, I mean if you're going to produce some sort of copyright material that you uh, see that has value, um, you probably should license it in some way because then everyone's square. Um, rather than sort of, you know, relying on fair use or substantiality or whatever. Yeah. Any further questions? Up, right up the back? Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, have we? Yeah. Oh, dear. Yes. Sorry. I've been holding up the sign. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Anyway, so, okay, I'm sure that Ben will be available for people to talk with after. And can we all thank Ben? Oh, thank you.